Ladies and gentlemen, dog lovers, this evening's meeting is the result of a chance conversation between Michael Gadsby and Stuart Bailey at Crufts and the subsequent formation of a Facebook group. Within 24 hours of being set up, the group had amassed more than 3,000 members. That figure has now increased, I believe, to approximately 5,000. At the outset, let me say that the purpose of this meeting is not to oppose the Kennel Club's stance on health monitoring. Quite the reverse, in fact. It is, it is to discuss the methods that were employed at Crufts and to attempt to produce a set of recommendations that will actually help the Kennel Club progress in its quest to improve the health of our purebred dogs, whilst at the same time supporting the breeders, the exhibitors, and the judges who fall under its jurisdiction. Tonight is not about bringing about the demise of the Kennel Club or contemplating an alternative. What I believe everyone in this room wants is a governing body in which it has total faith. Tonight, there will be no elephants in the room. So let me begin by saying that the screening of pedigree dogs exposed caused widespread reaction. Some may feel that the program was in some ways biased, but I believe I'm right in saying that those of us who genuinely love our dogs and love our breeds found viewing it uncomfortable and did cause us to question whether or not we were doing our best by our breeds from the health standpoint. Certainly those of us who judge dogs have possibly changed our priorities somewhat when we're in the ring, being even more mindful than we were before about not awarding prizes to dogs that displayed any visible signs of unsoundness or discomfort. The singling out by the Kennel Club of a specific number of breeds that were to be monitored differently from others did not rest easy with many. We were given advance warning of the decision that had been made and many of us had grave reservations as to how the logistics of veterinary examination of dogs in the listed breeds would work in practice. As I understand it, the overwhelming feeling after Crufts has centered around three major issues. Number one, not all breeds are being treated equally. Number two, there has been great criticism of the actual veterinary examination at Crufts. Several of those involved feeling that the inspection was far more aggressive than we had been assured. Number three, by withholding the best of breed awards from dogs who had been judged by some of the country's best respected and experienced judges on the opinion of one veterinary surgeon, this undermines the whole judging process in this country. Just so that we all know exactly where we stand and prior to asking the chairman to take over, could I please ask for a show of hands in response to the following question. Is anyone in this room against doing everything within our power to ensure that our breeds are as healthy as possible and that every dog exhibited is sufficiently fit to pass a basic health check. For the record, there is not one hand up in this room. I thank you for that. We're singing on the same hymn sheet. I now am going to ask for two 
shows of hands beyond that. And when the hands go up, there will be a head check, so keep your hands up until our monitors have been around the room. Could I please ask those of you who are Kennel Club members to raise your hand? Happily, I can drink and hold the microphone because I don't need to hold my hand up. <laughs> Keep them right up. Stuart's having a problem with his abacus. <laughs> 41 on your side, 20 on that side, so we have 61 Kennel Club members with us, that's very encouraging. The second show of hands, those of you who are members of the Kennel Club Assured Breeders Scheme, would you put my word, now that is overwhelming, this is going to take a lot of counting, so keep them right up please. While the silent counting is going on. Um, and I, it's best not to applaud because it will screw up the hands up business. Um, on your behalf, I'd like to say a big thank you to uh, Lindsay May, who was brought in at the last minute, um, courtesy of our chairman, to take the minutes. And she's been backed up by two great dog people, Julie Revel on my left and Leslie Tomlinson on my right. And we thank you both for the offers of help. It's much appreciated. Oh God, they can clap with one hand, it's wonderful. <laughs> On Stuart's side, 50, 57. 51. 51, that's amazing. We have 108 members of the Kennel Club Assured Breeders Scheme. Um, did the Stortons put the hands up? No, I had a funny feeling you wouldn't. Okay, so at this point of the meeting, um, I'm now going to hand over to a gentleman who's very kindly offered to chair the meeting. We asked him because his impartiality and his skills at controlling meetings are legend. Um, he's also very tall and he has a much deeper voice than I do. And I would please like you to give the warmest of welcomes to Mr. Martin Wiles. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for that applause. Andrew does like to lay it on. It's not all true what he says. Um, but thank you very much for allowing me to act as your chairman of this meeting. I do thank you all, and I hope that the mantle will not be a poison chalice. We have had a rather strange email stroke text from a member of the audience claiming that they are a member of equity and that they will be cl claiming a fee of £750 if their face appears on the film. <laughs> May I assure you that Dog World have been invited to film this meeting and have our permission to do so. If this does not suit the person involved, I suggest that they leave the meeting now. Right, as this is an open meeting, there is no agenda. But however, I would like now to pass on to Mike Gadsby, who's going to discuss and talk about the vet examination at Crufts. Mike? Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm just gonna go through um, what happened at the weekend and uh, basically to outline the areas um, I hope you're in agreement with uh, with me when when I say that uh, is to outline the areas where I think the health testing at Crufts failed. Um, <coughs> number one, 15 breeds were targeted rather than all breeds. Targeting anything with a huge, target anything was a huge mistake. Health and welfare is not lim limited to a sampling of breeds and is the foundation from which all dog breeders and, ex and exhibitors must begin. Number two, 
the selection of vets. By all accounts, this was left to the 11th hour, and the manner in which they were obtained is open to scrutiny. Number three, the ap appeal procedure put in place to give the, give the dogs, their owners, and the respective judges the benefit of the doubt, and no system of a second opinion, even though there were, for example, eye specialists present at the show. Number four, guaranteed procedure was not adhered to. The scheme was sold to us as being designed to replicate a, a judge's examination, which takes only two to three minutes and does not include the use of lights or other veterinary instruments. Number five, no one with authority was present to ensure that protocol was up upheld. Number six, exhibitors' feelings were never taken into consideration. A complete lack of empathy and respect for, for devoted and, pay, and the paying clientele. Number seven, press releases more damning because of what they didn't say. Viewers and other exhibitors could be led to believe that dogs were displaying conditions that, that, they didn't, that didn't exist. Number eight, there was spin and lies regarding lighting issues. How appalling that the area designated for examinations were not deemed satisfactory well in advance with such huge implications for all parties involved. Number nine, judges' feelings not taken into consideration, nor that they were expected to assume the role of a vet without the use of this, equip of, of this equipment. Number 10, implications of those inaccurate results to the exhibit, the exhibitor, the judge, to the breed, to all breeds, and to dogdom. Number 11, the Kennel Club's failure to react when massive flaws unfolded, despite pleas from myself and others to have emergency meetings to try and minimize the damage, the requests fell on deaf ears. Number 12, the KC glorifying the results. Was it necessary to publicly denounce these dogs on the TV and on the Kennel Club website, particularly when an appeal process was denied? Number 13, the Kennel Club misleading the general public. They stated that only exhibits that displayed exaggerations that had a negative impact on the health and well-being would be excluded. This was not the case in several cases, whether it was either previously or immediately after, were given clean bills of health. Steve Dean stated there had, that there had been great support. This support has no value because it was based on misinformation. Number 14, and the last point I'd like to make, is that the Kennel Club chose to implement the health check at Crufts when obvious flaws had not been ironed out. It was ludicrous not to adopt a softer launch to sort out the teething problems, or in, in this case, to rework the whole initiative. We're here tonight not, to attack, not just to attack the Kennel Club for its poor handling of this initiative, but to come up with a solution better suited to ensure fairness and openness, and to truly show the world that we support the health and welfare of our beloved dogs. Thank you. Are there any questions now of Mike while he's up here, please? I'm Maureen William, and I have St. Bernard's, my great St. Bernard's, since 1967. I would just like to inquire, how long did the eye examination take while that was I'm afraid, unless there's somebody here who was actually in one of those meetings who could actually uh, state... Uh, I, ah, here we are, we have Mr. Stork. <laughs> Uh, Derek Stoughton, Bassett Hounds. Um, I didn't time the event myself, but I believe I was told afterwards that it took 20 minutes. The majority of that time was spent in a, an aggressive examination of the eyes. Um, we were led to the, the booth, or whatever you could call it, for the examination. Um, the movement was actually taken outside. Um, we were then brought back. Uh, and the other parts of the dog were examined at the speed of judgment, examine it. And then I should think that uh, three quarters of the rest of the time were spent poking around the eyes, moving the eyelids up and down. Um, a dog with a not such a good a nature as mine I wouldn't, might not have accepted what was happening to it. But all in all, I believe it took about 20 minutes. Yeah, the pick, I believe Miss, uh, Mr. Easton's here, the pack, pick and ease. Ah, it's okay. Uh, Mrs. Stannard would like to make a, a point. 
Hi, I'm Liz Stannard and I'm the Pekingese Health Representative as well as the Pekingese Liaison Officer and I have the whole report from Mrs. Mrs. Smith who was the exhibitor with the Pekingese which was the first breed to not have its best of breed confirmed at Crufts. She has given me permission to read whatever parts of this you want to hear. According to her, yes, it did take about 15 minutes which is obviously a lot more than a judge would be allowed for any breed in the ring. Um, Agreeing with Mr. Scorton, I think they have the same vet. She found him very um, abrasive, very abrupt. Uh, there was no empathy with either her or the dog. As I've explained earlier, the main reason I am here, and I'm obviously, and without being big headed, Mr. Chairman or Andrew, but I think probably from a Kennel Club committee position, I am the most high profile person in this room. So, you know. You can all perhaps go back and show your dogs and do whatever. My career could be at a complete end at the end of this year. <laughs> but I do feel very strongly about my breed. And I'm glad to see so many other people here in other breeds that are not in the 15 high profile. Because as I've said right from the beginning, today it's 15 high profile. Tomorrow it'll be 25. Yeah. Next. One of the, thing, the, the, one of the main things, apart from being here to represent Pekingese, is that I have been to all of the meetings that the Kennel Club have held regarding this vet testing. I have been as a breed health officer, as a liaison officer, and as a general championship show secretary. So I've been to four meetings. I have heard what has been said. I have actually been copied in print as to asking all of the questions that the general championship show secretaries wanted answering for when we have to do it at our show. And one of the main reasons I am standing here now is to say that all of those meetings, which we were told a completely different way of as it actually happened at Crufts. And I want to object most strongly not just that it happened and the dogs failed, which I think was a dreadful, dreadful thing, but that it wasn't done the way we were told it was going to be done. And if it wasn't done at the Kennel Club's own show, what are we going to do at our shows? Right, my name is Margaret Ledwood and I'm in Bassett's. And I went to the health meeting at Stone Lee. The new chairman of the Kennel Club was quite categorically and stated, what will happen is the best of breed will be escorted by a Kennel Club rep to the vet, who will do a simple hands-on examination and movement. He, will make, he or she will make a report which will be handed to the Kennel Club rep, who will take it to the show committee, who will make the final decision. <laughs> now that's what I was told, and I know there's lots of people who attended that health meeting, and that's exactly what we were told, that it, the final decision would be made by the show committee. So I would like to know, I mean, if he was here, I would have asked him, I mean, what happened to the show committee? I think I've got here the introduction from the Kennel Club dated the 12th, sorry, the February 2012. And the paragraph which we're relating to your query says, a health check will be a veterinary visual op observation. Nothing about using any form of uh, equipment an opinion at the time for the purpose of establishing whether the dog is fit for function. It goes on a bit further, a championship show veterinary surgeon is not expected to judge the dogs for conformational defects, which are of an anesthetic, or, sorry, atheistic nature only. So, you know, it, this rough handling or handling certainly should not be there. supposed to be made by the committee, not the vet. No, definitely, definitely by the vet. It's, it's again in here. Right. 
with my championship show secretary's hat on now, I was at the same meeting as you. No, I can tell you. The two things I'm really objecting to are, firstly, that the vet used any aids, because Steve Dean said at all the meetings I was at, the vets will use no aids. It was actually reported in the paper at that wording. They would judge the dogs. They would look at the dogs as a judge would with their hands and their eyes. The other thing I am objecting to, and I objected on the day when I made the objection, is, and we were told, and we were told as championship show secretaries, so we'd know how to put the system into place, that the dogs, as opposed to the coat testing, did not have to be taken straight from the ring to the vet. You had the time to go to the vet in your own time to get the form signed or not signed, to take it back to the secretary to get your best of breed card when the secretary could then inform the group stewards that that breed, best of breed was able to go in the group. Obviously, you had to do it in a certain amount of time. You weren't going to do it as they were calling the group. But there was certainly, and he insisted on this, it will not be like the coat testing. You will not be marched from the ring. You could go to the vet when your bitch had gone back or your dog had gone back to the bench, had a drink or a wee or whatever. But that are the two main points that I am disagreeing on. And those were the things that were actually said to us at all of the meetings. Uh, Liz, can I just ask something? Um, one, I believe, I spoke to the Smiths, the people with the Pekingese. Is it in that report that they refused uh, the opportunity to give the dog a drink? Yes, yes. I have, I have a whole report here. The first thing she said, and I'm sitting next to the breed judge, he did walk them considerably. He put a lot of effort into it. It was a big class limit bitch. They went around the ring. They did a large triangle. She was then chosen as the winner of limit. She had a few minutes, open was in, she went back for the bitch ticket, she did the same triangle round the ring, picked as the bitch ticket. She then went back against the dog, did another large triangle, got best of breed. They stood on the table, they had the photos taken, and she was then taken instantly to this small made up booth, which in her report says was brightly lit with white walls and a strip light, so there's no excuse for the vet having to use a torch because he couldn't see. And the first thing she said to him, and she was in a very distressed state, she is a, a nice lady, but not a forceful person. She wouldn't stand up and talk like I would. Um, but the first thing she said to the vet was, can my bitch have a drink of water? Because of all this walking she'd done. And his words were, no. Not, no, I haven't the facilities, or no, we'll have to wait a minute. No. And it is in here in black and white in Mrs. Smith's words. Yeah. Can, can I just say something, as in, because I know a little bit more about this, that um, because uh, Caroline Kisco um, went on the podcast with Marina and said that the reason why the um, veterinary instruments, the torches, were used um, was because the lighting in the rooms were insufficient. So um, we decided that we would get into the rooms and, and take some photographs of the... Um, <laughs> Anyway, there were, truly was, this was Friday morning and there truly was strip lights in the rooms. Um, feeling like I do, could do cartwheels to the uh, Kennel Club office, I managed to see Catherine Sim, who, who sort of damaged my um, great find a little bit by saying that the strip lights were put in on, fr on Thursday evening. Um, and that was the reason, the reasoning behind it was because the, um, the lighting was poor. So what we did on Sunday morning was we found the same um, pod or whatever it's called and um, there was no light switch inside the pod so we managed to trace the electrics along to a trip box <laughs> and with a touch of trepidation I flicked the first switch thinking oh my god I could spoil the whole show now but anyway the thing was we managed to switch the lighting off inside these rooms and we took more photographs um, and I can assure you Never been caught in a lie yet, and apart from my age. But the lighting was exactly the same inside the rooms as it was outside. And so bearing in mind that we were assured that the examination would take place exactly the way the judge would, would do so, 
the lighting in the whole of the NEC could be better, but it was exactly the same with the lights off for the uh, veterinary ex uh, vet as it was for the, um, for the judges. So there was some spin and indiscrepancies there. Thank you. There's a gentleman at the back, actually, who's been jumping up and down, waiting very patiently. Hello, my name is uh, Howard Ogden. Uh, in my dog capacity, uh, I award certificates in all the toy breeds and won uh, bred the best of breed in Griffins this year. Uh, in my professional life, uh, I'm a solicitor. And it could be a long night. It won't be a long night because you're not paying me. And I have written an article for the canine press. Um, I notice it didn't hit Dog World, but I wait to see whether it's going to hit our dogs when that comes out. I have looked at the legal position. Uh, and I've tried to analyze it in a, in a proper fashion. Uh, and I'll bore you a little bit with it, uh, but I've also um, written to uh, Steve Dean. I'm quite sure uh, that the Kennel Club are in breach of their contract to the exhibitors. The contract is made up of an entry form and a schedule. Uh, and uh, if, when you go home, if you haven't thrown out your schedules, you will look at page 45, which is the uh, notice regarding the um, high-profile breeds. And then, uh, to save you uh, having to do what I had to do, you get to page 135 of the 140 pages in the schedule, you will come to regulation at 29 with regards to the show, which you will find is in two parts. Look at page 45, look at those two parts, uh, and you will find a uh, confusing uh, explanation uh, of the system with regards to the high profile breeds uh, vet checks. And in particular, I can find no basis in any of those entries for the use of an outside veterinary agency because the references are to the official show vet. Uh, and of course, there was Dr. Uh, Andreas Schimmel heading up a team uh, of uh, vets uh, and various specialists uh, to boot, um, none of whom were used or consulted at any time. To take up uh, point whatever of uh, uh, Mike's uh, very good analysis there, it seems to me that there is no judge in the land, and I don't seek any business, this is not my bag, I hasten to add, there is no judge in the land, nor in that matter in Croatia, uh, and I see no reason uh, why, if she were of such a mind, proceedings cannot be issued in Croatia. They don't have to be issued here. No judge will uphold a system as being fair where there is no appeal process. It is not rocket science. The um, uh, schedule uh, and entry form represents your uh, express uh, conditions. But in a contract, there are implied conditions. Uh, and uh, this afternoon, I wanted to double check something which I had uh, noted and found hard to believe at the time. And I have double checked because I wanted to check the wording. Uh, and the secretary of the Kennel Club uh, has implied certain conditions with regards to the vet's check on uh, her interview um, on more four when she said this and i quote her we do not expect the the vet to do anything the judge would not be able to do 
the external examination is what it is. And with regards to the eyes, they will be examined in exactly the same way as the judge. And she went on to refer to various scopes, stethoscopes, oroscopes. I don't like to think what that is or where you put it. Uh, and um, in, in reference to that, she was absolutely clear uh, that there would be no scopes. And accordingly, she concluded um, uh, that uh, the judge would have the opportunity to see what the vet will have the opportunity to see, end of. It is my understanding on the available information that that is not what occurred. If it did not happen in the way that the Secretary of the Kennel Club is envisaging and implying as part and parcel of the conditions to which the relevant exhibitors are being made subject, then, uh, as far as uh, I can see, uh, there can be no basis uh, to say that the Kennel Club have uh, kept their part of the bargain, which is another way of saying. Uh, that they would be in breach uh, of their contract. Uh, I believe that they would be successfully sued. Uh, the actions are based on what is called loss of status in terms of your reputation uh, and a loss of enjoyment because at the very pinnacle of success you're denied the opportunity to go on in terms of the group. They're not huge claims. Uh, and in my article, which is called um, Free Legal Advice for All, <laughs> and in my letter to Mr. Dean, uh, I have suggested, uh, first, as I say, that uh, the claims will succeed. I've got no doubt about that. Uh, because if you do not have a system that is transparent, that has clarity, and has fairness inbuilt into it, then no court will support you. Would <laughs> With regards to settling the claims, uh, I have advised uh, thus. First, uh, that the best of breeds be restored. Second, uh, that there be an apology. Uh, uh, grateful thanks for taking part in our pilot scheme. <laughs> regrets that we had some teething troubles but nonetheless a signed apology uh, from uh, the chairman further that there be an ex-gratia payment of say 500 to a grand and that they pray that such ex-gratia payment be accepted but above all, that, and maybe it's something for this meeting to consider, that there should be an immediate suspension of the scheme. That is not to say that it's not a scheme that, that one supports, that it isn't laudable, uh, that uh, there isn't uh, plenty which is, is right about it. That is not the issue. We all acknowledge the health aspects of this. That is not the issue now. The issue is the implementation of it. And unless and until uh, there is transparency, that there is clarity, and that there is fairness, uh, then, unless the Kennel Club want to continue uh, with regards to uh, the need to settle claims if, if they are sought to be brought, uh, then I really just think that they need to pause, to step back, to acknowledge uh, that things have, have uh, gone awry, uh, and to take stock, uh, and therefore to put in this breathing space. I'm not confident but I, would, I feel better uh, from the, the lawyer point of view uh, and the dogman point of view uh, 
uh, to at least have, have said it uh, and to hope uh, that uh, the reputation which is clearly damaged uh, in the wider world of, of dogs may yet be restored. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. Can, uh, I don't... Just out of interest, and I'm not 100% sure whether we're right for doing this, but what's my iPad? Um, can we just, this cease uh, of this health testing in its current format, it would be interesting to see, I suspect to know the answer, if people raise their hands uh, in favour of that motion. As to cease. Okay, it's probably best to ask, is there anybody who thinks it should be continued in its present form? Right, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much. Andrew, you'd like to say a few words? Okay, just three points picking up on what's just been said there. Um, as far as Howard was, was bringing up the legal implications of the use of devices or whatever you want to call them. Um, <clears throat> at um, three o'clock this morning, I think it was, because I haven't had much sleep in the last few days. I was just looking on the Kennel Club website and I found in at least three places it was stated categorically that there would be no devices used. And interestingly, one of the positions where this was mentioned was actually on their page where it lists what they were looking for when they were canvassing for vets. Um, it, was, it was quite a detailed statement saying what they wanted and what they didn't want, but it specifically said that they would not be required or expected to use any external devices. Um, <clears throat> secondly, um, Howard touched on the, um, at least I assumed he was, he was referring to the beautiful Columbus Spaniel who would come all the way from Croatia, who has titles in 14 countries, won the CC at Crafts two years ago, and for those of you who weren't aware of it by now, had within the last four weeks won both a group and a specialty best in show under both John Thirlwell, who was judging the Crufts group, and Frank Kane, who was judging Best in Show. That's a bit of background. Um, many of you will have already seen the interview um, on Dog World TV. The, the number of hits was, was just amazing within 24 hours. Um, I am in fairly close contact with Lana Levi, um, the, the lady who owns the, the Clumber, and it was interesting in, the, in her interview, how she made um, a point of stressing that this Columbus Spaniel was actually bred in Denmark, where their health tests are probably more stringent than anywhere else in Europe. In fact, the Danish Kennel Club has come in for some flack over the years for their, their health regime being possibly too strict. That was just a little bit of a background. Um, interestingly, um, Lana is not short of a bob or two, and I understand that legal action may well be taken. And uh, I'm, I'm sure those of you who, who, who've seen um, following the Facebook group, um, on the Monday morning, the Clumber bitch, Lana herself, had actually gone to the Clumber National in the United States. Um, her handler, Antonio Vidmar, took the clumber bitch to one of the leading eye specialists who was based in, in a highly thought of clinic in Vienna for thorough eye testing, emailed me a copy of the certificate, which was dated the 12th of March, which was possibly the most thorough eye examination certificate I've ever seen. Um, and this bitch was absolutely 100% clear with no question marks whatsoever. The third point, which, which is, is going to come as a huge shock to you, and it follows on from what Liz said um, about the, um, the fact that the Pekingese was denied water, which I think is absolutely outrageous. Outrageous. Um, however, there has been an inference that all the best of breed winners were immediately dragged off to the vet. Now, my sticking up for the kennel club doesn't happen very often. But in this instance, let me say that I was very, very diligent in watching the judging of German Shepherds this year. 
and I watched the best to breed, which went to El Mosetog, for whom I have, I have great regard. And I have to say, in the interests of fair play, because this meeting is not biased, that I was around the ringside when Elmo was awarded best to breed. They allowed photographs to be taken. Catherine Sim came to the ring and went out of her way to say, um, if you want to give the dog a drink, Maybe they'd learn from the Pekingese lesson, possibly. Take your time. That's where the porter cabin is. Come when you're ready. And attempted to be as pleasant as possible to the owners and the handlers. So I do want that put on record, because let's not be accused here of putting things in a, in, in a one-sided manner. Um, right. Now I'm back in character. However, <coughs> when I attempted to follow Elmo and Steve Cox and the lady vet outside into a public area outside the NEC, I was physically restrained by Bill Lambert, who told me I would not be allowed to go outside and watch the German Shepherd move. For what reasons, I can only guess, but that is a fact. Okay, that's my little bit for now. Uh, Ron Punter, I judged the Lakeland Terriers at Crufts this year and I was rather bemused by the judges' briefing because uh, I listened to it and I didn't really understand much of it and they clearly didn't want questions but I managed to jump in and ask if I understood it correctly that under the regulations I could award both CCs but withhold the best of breed and I was told yes, that's what is the case. So I then asked, well, on what basis would I do that? I mean, I didn't say this explicitly at the time, I just signed the certificate to say the dog is free of health problems, noticeable exaggerations, and I'm clearly of the opinion that it's worthy, it's of such outstanding merit as to be worthy of the title of champion. And I've just signed that certificate and I can withhold the best of breed from it. Well, this is nonsense. And when did that regulation come in? And when I mentioned this later to Gerald King, when he thanked me for judging, and I told him I didn't agree with what was going on, um, he said, oh, that's been in for some time. Now, I, <laughs> It left me wondering what is going on. I mean, that appears to be an attempt to establish that um, the CCs can stand, even if the best of breed is not awarded. Um, but it's, uh, I'm sorry, but is it just me? Well, I just thought I would add that in because I think that, if that is the regulation, it needs to be looked at along with the veterinary examination side of things. Thank, Thank you very much, much for signing a certificate for a dog that isn't worthy of the best of green. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Stuart, please. Um, Stuart Mallard, I was also at the meeting, but not your one. I was also at that meeting, and the thing is, when this um, all started and the thing with the vets, I did say at Windsor to Steve Dean that in 15 breeds, if I had a poor entry and the quality wasn't there, that I would not send a dog through to best of breed for a vet to deny it. Well, he said that would be sorted out. What's happened is they've misunderstood their own ruling because I queried Ruth Barbara, I said that's quite impossible that people can just be withholding best of breed. What they meant was, in the 15 breeds, because a vet had to verify it, you could indicate your best of breed, but it wasn't actually a best of breed until the vet had done it. But in the meeting, and I have to say Pat Sutton did the same apparently, they gave the impression that you could award both the tickets and withhold best of breed, which is absolutely a nonsense, and I wouldn't have it. And I saw Ruth Barber next time and I said, look what you're doing. You're giving out a very mixed message. It's quite wrong. She said, Stuart, she said, these rules are new and we're trying to interpret them. 
And I said, yes, but you made them. So, <laughs> no, that is not good. Ron, Ron Stewart, King Charles Spaniels. I didn't even show this year, uh, but I went down on Sunday just as a member of the public, and I did meet a very agitated Andrew Brace at one stage. <laughs> um, I'm a kennel club member, um, but like a lot of you don't hiss. Like a lot of kennel club members, I have no power. Oh, it's you. <laughs> um, now, I must confess, when I first heard about this whole scheme, I had some severe reservations. Um, and I've heard nothing tonight that um, has quieted any of them. Now, we've discussed principally um, considerations and discussions and thoughts within the Kennel Club. My concern is whether the Kennel Club has been unduly naive in this whole concept and have basically cowed out to the lowest form of political correctness going. Um, my explicit concern is over the vets. Um, how were they selected? How did they volunteer? What was the criteria? How were the vets vetted, basically? And if I was going to be entirely cynical, which generally speaking I am, the question has to be, what was their motivation? And I would like some of those answers. Um, and just as a throwaway line, um, I've no doubt that there will be a number of initiatives come out of these discussions tonight, and uh, my learned friend Howard will go down the legal route and other people will do other things. However, I do have another concern, and that concern is that the Kennel Club will take the wagons round and form a defensive wall and keep the outsiders out. And I would su suggest that those of us who are Kennel Club members have an AGM coming up in the very near future, and we have the best part of a month to put forward motions for discussion at the AGM, and we should exercise that right. Thank you. Is it you? Yeah. We, uh, Andrew, just like to say a few words regarding Stuart Mallard's. Actually, Ron, I think you'll find that there are enough Kennel Club members in this room to call a special general meeting. But let's not go down that road at this point. Just picking up on something that Stuart said, which has bothered me enormously, and as Howard is in the room, um, I'd like to ask, and I, I'm not putting her on the spot at all, but she's the only person in the room that can answer the question. Um, on the FOSS data site, where's Cathy? Where's Cathy? Is she not here? I thought I saw her earlier on. No, okay, is, is someone from FOSS data here? Because it is quite an, Bill, it is quite an important question. When you look on the results site of the breeds in which best of breed was not awarded, it simply says not awarded. It doesn't say that a best of breed was awarded and then disallowed. Was FOSS data given any instructions by the Kennel Club as to how that should be worded? Stuart has the microphone. Yes, they were. My name is Bill Moores, Company Secretary of FOSS Data. Yes, they were given specific instructions. Okay. My point is, and um, for those of you who haven't already got there, if I had been the owner of the challenge certificate winner who was best opposite sex in those breeds, the fact that best of breed was not awarded on that site leaves my dog wide open to speculation as that my dog was the one that actually failed the health test. And I think Mr. Ogden would have a field day with that one. And is, is Liz wanting to say something now? Can I just pass the microphone over to Liz, Donald? 
Firstly, in answer to the Lakeland Terrier gentleman about the best of breeds, yes, it is a new regulation. It came in on January the 1st this year, and you'll notice that it actually now says, instead of saying judges must award a best of breed from the unbeaten dog and bitch, the regulation now says judges may award a best of breed from the unbeaten dog and bitch. That applies in every breed. It is not just the 15 high profile. So that is actually a regulation. And I have heard that some of the judges for the high profile breeds feel they will get out of this, having their best of breed go to the vet because they're not going to declare a best of breed at all. And can I just answer Andrew's thing? The wording on the FOSS data site may say that, and they may have been told to say that, but if you read any of the Kennel Club things that Steve Dean says, the wording is very explicit. Best of breed was awarded by the judge. What has happened is, best of breed has not been confirmed. That is the wording, confirmed. And it is only confirmed and when the vet confirms the best of the judges. So that is the wording, it's confirmed. There has been a best of breed. It was awarded in the ring. But they didn't get the card and they won't do until it is confirmed by the vet. No, it didn't say that on the results act, but it does say that on our general championship show paperwork. I've got a gentleman down here who's been waiting first, but I do think we will quite shortly, we ought to move on and decide where we're going to go from here. We've had a lot of discussion regarding the judges and uh, the health tests. We all agreed where uh, we feel they're, they're wrong, but we now need to discuss, decide what we're going to do about it. But, sir, if you'd like to uh, have a few words. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jeffrey Davis, and I've listened with interest the um, comments that have been made by Howard Ogden and the comments that have been made by Mr. Stewart of the Marchog, King Charles, Spaniel, and Nathan Pinchers. And I have a couple of comments and observations of my own that I would like to share with you this evening. They are as follows. The consequence of the health examinations in, introduced at Crofts 2012 have had a devastating effect upon the world of pedigree dogs. Whilst it is the right of the Kennel Club to evolve policy to meet the needs of the, support, of the sport, they have an even greater responsibility to think through the implementation and the ramifications of such policies. This they have failed to do, resulting in confusion, mayhem, tremendous anguish, and to all those involved, absolute trauma. And most importantly, what distresses me is the obvious division that is emerging in the world of pedigree dogs. The second point I would like to make is as follows. Months ago, I attended a group judges meeting where we were given assurances that judges could be present at the examination of the best of breed winner. A subsequent statement confirmed that no veterinary implement would be used during the course of the examination. This is not the case. When judging a new breed or judging a breed at risk, the judges in question are assessed by a, a, a health monitor. Um, my question is who is monitoring the vets and what consequences do they face as a result of the decisions? The thing I ask for which is not unreasonable, is a level playing field for all those concerned. 
my next point. Last week, during the last week, I have been in regular touch with two people that, whose exhibit was not allowed to represent the breed in the group. Their lives have been utterly devastated by their experience. And to quote them, they feel they are living through a nightmare. They feel humiliated. They feel ashamed. Their only crime is that they have, for a number of years, bred fit, healthy, sound dogs of good temperament without exaggeration uh, and the latest example is uh, they bred the recent best in show winner at Westminster. In addition to their personal feelings, like many others, they are so worried about the love and, of, and the breed they have served so well. My question is, what support is the Kennel Club providing to those that have been traumatized by such a dreadful action. Finally, and in conclusion, let us all remind ourselves that the very backbone of this sport is Mr. and Mrs. Average, who have devoted years of their lives and considerable amounts of money in supporting the dogs that they love. Rather than pander to the extremist who are determined to discredit and destroy our sport, let the Kennel Club be more committed to supporting those that are at the very grassroots of this sport and have devoted their lives, irrespective of breed. These people deserve better. Could I ask Geoffrey which group judges meeting he refers to? Uh, I refer to the one that you actually attended where during, I have tried during uh, the last three years to be as supportive as I can to the Kennel Club through these very turbulent times and the majority of you know, who know me know that I have been supportive even to the point of supporting uh, veterinary um, examinations quote, saying that I feel that they are an endorsement of a judge's decision and in no way to criticise them. I think that my trust has been abused and I feel dreadfully, dreadfully let down by the actions that have been displayed across. No, the, the, the reason I ask was because the business of um, if we were going to have to take these examinations on board of the breed judge being present was something that I laboured at that meeting, if you remember, Geoffrey. I did indeed. I asked Ronnie Irving in the middle of the meeting if it would not be a good idea to give the breed judge the opportunity, don't make it obligatory, give them the opportunity for the breed judge to be in on the veterinary examination for the simple reason that I genuinely believe there could be a situation where a vet who's not terribly experienced in a breed could have an area of concern and given that the breed judge was standing there, he could have said, Mrs. Stannard, I have a little bit of a problem with this. Could you explain something to me? Which I think would have been a wonderful opportunity for the breed judge. Ronnie said it was going to be completely impractical. At the end of the meeting, or as the meeting was closing down, I got up and I asked if we could have a show of hands from all the group judges in the Kennel Club building that day as to whether or not they felt giving the breed judge the chance to be present for the veterinary examination was a good idea. And Dr. Ruth Barber said to me, we don't have time for that. We have to close the meeting. People want to get home now, sit down and it was never put to a show of hands. That is a fact. Heather Stoughton Bassett, can I say that the main, sorry, 
The main reason that my dog failed that examination was that he was bred to the breed standard. Now, when my husband went into that room, what that vet said to him was, I'm judging this dog as a dog, not as a basset hound. Now, <laughs> it wouldn't... <laughs> so, the whole point about this is if the, the breed standard isn't there, if it truly is unimportant to the vet, then there's no point in us all doing this. I, I would argue that any Basset who had gone into that room would have failed that test. <laughs> I'm, so I'm, I'm sure that the pigs are the same, certainly the Clumber Spaniel. I mean, that Clumber Spaniel, uh, we looked at that the night before on the telly, and, and I said to my husband, well, if that's failed, we're doomed. And, and really and truly, this is what you've got to seriously look at, is what the brief was to those vets. And the brief was, ignore the breed standard and just go for this. I would have taken in a mongrel, a mongrel would have passed. So, uh, you know, with my, my, the breed standard that's in place with Bassets, I cannot produce the animal they want me to take into that veterinary, veterinary room. I, you know, I, I may not be clever. Maybe somebody else can do it. I can't produce, in my particular breed standard, a lozenge-shaped eye that, that will get through that exam. And my dog, I hasten to add, isn't exaggerated. In fact, all the Basset people here would probably say, he's got a good eye. Even the vet, when we went in, apparently said to my husband, for a Basset, he's got a good eye. That was before this all started. So... Mm. Thank oh. you very much. That's all right. <laughs> uh, shortly, we're going to have to move on with some um, recommendations about how we can, well, you know, the prog progress we're going to make tonight. I just want to say one thing that, you know, if you, I'm very close friends that, with the vet that we use, and um, he would tell you that they have a lot of mongrels, a lot of crossbreeds, a lot of designer crossbreeds that wouldn't meet, as well as a lot of pedigree dogs that wouldn't meet um, close scrutiny. So. Unfortunately, health affects every living um, thing on the planet. Anyway, as far as I can see it, there are two aspects to the handling of this thing with the Kennel Club and the health tests over the weekend. And that was that, one, it was ill-conceived. Um, there were so many problems. But I think the biggest indi indictment was that when it was brought to their attention that uh, what a catastrophe this was, that it didn't matter whether they had important lunches to go to or whether they had to do a tour of the building with Prince Michael of Kent, nothing mattered more than an emergency meeting to try and minimise the damage. So what I'm saying is I feel that the Kennel Club have, de have let us down on several levels and I think the ill-conceived uh, ideas were less um, of an indictment then for them to refusing to see how much damage they were doing. And then for um, the spokesperson of the Kennel Club to go on the podcast and try and um, take the blame away for the use of the instruments that was promised would never happen. Um, there is no excuse. And I think that we're fed up of spin and we're fed up of people trying to pull the wool over our eyes. And that is why tonight, we're here in this meeting and it's really vital that we come up with some health solutions that we don't want, we've got nothing to hide. Everybody's been trying to breed healthy dogs for years. We can't, it's not like building a television that we can get it dead right because they're living beings. But the point is that all of us are committed to health. We're all committed to uh, great temperaments. And I think now we need to move on to how we can offer a recommendation to the Kennel Club about how we could implement um, those a, a new a new regime as far as health is concerned. Thank you. Judy McMurray, St Bernard's. At our refresher day held in November, Steve Dean was asked if it were possible if we could liaise with the vets and take them through our standard and our characteristics. And he said he would welcome the cooperation between our breed and vets and couldn't see any reason for it. So following on from that, I would like to know what remit the vets were given if we know this, and at what stage did we know that devices were being used? As there was no one else in the room, was the vet not following the instructions he was given by the Kennel Club, 
or did the kennel club know that he was using these devices? Can anyone answer that I was going to say, I certainly can't answer that, but I don't know whether there's anybody in the room who's, who can answer that. But it's certainly a question that they answer, the kennel club should answer, for sure. Thank you. Good evening, my name's Maureen Taylor and I have Columbus Spaniels and have done since 1983 and for my sins I am due to judge the breed next year at Crufts. <laughs> exactly, were possibly. I'm also a member of the Kennel Club so God help me really. Um, I'm just, the point that Mrs Staunton made, um, one of our exhibitors went and had their Columba eye tested by Mr Bedford at the show and he told this gentleman that under no circumstances would any Columbus Spaniel in this country pass the vet test for the simple reason that the breed watch, and this is what we have to pay attention to when judging, states that excessive amounts of loose facial skin with conformational defects of the upper and lower eyelids so that the eyelid margins are not in normal contact with the eye. Now that means that it's got to be tight up against the eyeball. Like your breed, our breed standard states that haw is allowed. Not excessive, but haw. You pull your eye down, a little bit of haw, and what happens? Your eyelid comes away from your eye. So no clumber and no basset are going to get through the health test at all. Thank you.